We will start in five minutes. We're just waiting for Professor McKenzie, oh, not Professor McKenzie, uh, the, the Vice Principal Research, Innovation and Commercialization. So we're just waiting for her. And just a note for the people in the room that the people sitting this side, you will get all the questions. So you're welcome to move if you don't want to. <laughs> Thank you, we'll start in five minutes. Thank you.
Colleagues, we, we are ready to start. Welcome to everyone in the room and to the 27 people following on YouTube. It's a great honor to welcome you all to the session surrounding Professor Peter Jandrik from the University of Applied Sciences in Zagreb. A special word of honor to Professor Teniwa Miiwa. She's a feminist scholar. She's part of the executive management of the University of South Africa serving as a vice principal for the research postgraduate studies innovation and commercialization portfolio and i'm out of breath saying that <laughs> i don't know how you do that she has also served as a university registrar at the durban university of technology she has extensive experience in higher education as a teacher researcher and in administration Prior to her appointment at UNISA, she worked at various higher education institutions, including the Human Sciences Research Council as a senior manager and researcher. She has an impeccable academic leadership and mentorship record with a strong focus on social science research in general and indigenous knowledge systems. Prof. Mahiwa has worked in South Africa and internationally with organizations and research teams ranging from government organizations universities and human rights NGOs. She's a member of various parastatal community and civil society organizations such as the Rural Women's Movement where she is an advisory board member. She has served and continues to do so in several leadership roles outside of UNISA. For example, as chairperson of evaluation committees and as lead researcher. She has also served on the National Heritage Council. 
uh, and the South African National Herald D Council as chairperson. She has presented numerous conference papers at national and international forums, as well as authored numerous research articles and published books. That's the official bio. Two interesting things that you may not know, her most cited article, quote, is private transgressions, colon, the visual voice of Zulu women. Uh, that, that sounds amazing. And her second most cited article is perceptions and experiences of motherhood, colon, a study of black and woman, white women, uh, white, black and white mothers of Durban, South Africa. Prof, over to you. Thank you so much. Let's give a hand to Prof Miwa. Uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Paul Prince Lou for that. Uh, I must start off by greeting everybody and also on the on the platforms across the uh, the spectrum across the world. I'm aware that we being um, shown all over, and I'm not going to be able to stay for the entire time. And the good thing about digitization is that I'll be able to access this later. And we're recording it, and thank you for, uh, for Peter for actually beautifying our archives. So your being here is definitely going to beautify our archives. I must actually say that today becomes a very important day for me personally. Uh, we are, um, should we take this that way? Yeah, and I'm differently abled. <laughs> thank you. So... <laughs> Just, just this morning, I was with uh, the chancellor uh, of the university, that is the tutelar head of the university, His Excellency Dr. Tabon Begin. Uh, we are working on um, the presidential library. Uh, the materials, you cannot believe it, they actually span about um, five kilometers, the materials that is brought to us to digitize. Talk, it, it's just so exciting. It's only not going to be um, the digitization, the digitization of uh, his materials, but of other uh, presidents in the continent. So be jacked up for that kind of work that's upcoming. I mention this because also the collaboration that we're enjoying and the lecture that we're about to listen to uh, this afternoon relates to just what uh, Prof. Jandrik uh, is working on in, alongside Prof. Paul Prinsloo, uh, who are esteemed scholars working on this project. We're happy as uh, the university to be hosting you, and we hope that uh, you shall have this relationship cemented as we get Prof. Prinsloo media or thereabout Prof. to go to the other side. With that said, um, it is, I'm actually somehow unhappy that the College of Human Sciences, probably they'll attend online, are not part of this because they They've started a project on a, a digital humanities or humanities digitalization uh, process. This is a, a, an indication of the fact that uh, tenants of uh, not just only the digital process but post-digital, which is what um, uh, this process is about, uh, the projects that they have been co-funded for and that they are uh, sponsored, uh, under Erasmus is uh, very exciting. It has the tenets that can be summarized as I'm made aware in, in these um, elements. The digital uh, is no longer a separate realm, so we're actually aware of that. We, we, there's no way we can, as you are aware, uh, go without taking technology, uh, allowing technology to take us further away and further afar. So we're seeing this integration uh, and in, 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 in essence, and in the sense that the digital is no longer separate, but it is part of the everyday reality, demonstrated by what we're doing right now. In this room that's physical, we seem to be few, but indeed, uh, not just only the colleagues and uh, partners that are outside of this room participating, but we are archiving this, and it shall become the World Wide Web uh, uh, work that we shall be able to, to look into and work with. Also, the importance of materiality and embodiment uh, of this kind of work, uh, recognize the importance of the materials and how we actually get the digital technology, uh, not only 
uh, get to be acknowledging the physical world, but also the importance of the interconnectedness between the two, which is what we're appreciating as, as UNISA and on behalf of FAMAS actually um, raise this um, coincidentally, uh, concurrently with the Vice Chancellor, the head of the institution, at a meeting, and she sends her, her greetings. And hence, I will not stay for the entire time here, but later uh, we'll be joining you through the digital mode. The need for critical engagement, uh, as the two colleagues have demonstrated, with a whole lot number of people behind them, by the way, that uh, from day to day I get to acknowledge and Prof. Prince Lu um, bring to my office to, to officiate and Prof. Mkansi and all the, the weeping that I get from, from their end somehow is um, comforting for me because it does demonstrate the kind of work and the depth of work that we have there. Uh, with, with that said, we are recognizing the critical engagement which we shall be seeing from the two respondents that we have, thanks professors, uh, Professor Milan and uh, Prof. Makwe, the MM. Uh, we've chosen them specifically because of that and the fact that they're women. It wasn't just coincidental, it was properly planned. We shall have them to critically engage with the work that we shall be hearing and also get the recognition of not just only the experiences we're having in this room, but varied, intertwined experiences. With these words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I know nowadays I like to say boys and girls because I see my grandchildren when I get to participate in such meetings that they're actually part of it and we ask, who's that or whatever. So somehow we're getting to educate um, our young ones uh, through the forms and platforms uh, that we, we participate in. you welcome to uh, to UNISA, I know yesterday we had activities through Prof. Leseka, the engagement, I uh, understand, is also attending uh, through digital means, and that we are looking forward to learn more of what you're going to be sharing with us. Prof, uh, over to you, in terms of the doors are open, they've been open since Monday, since you actually arrived in the country, and from uh, the head of the institution, which coincidentally, as I said, Ella, I was with a uh, President uh, Tabumbegi himself, one of the presidents that we very much pride ourselves uh, with, but also the Chancellor, Vice Chancellor herself, are aware of this work, and we very much are excited that uh, these coincidental happenings could not have happened had it not been for the sole focus of this university of going digital, going technology, and embracing all that we have not done in the past. You welcome. I hope the lecture is an enjoyable one and that uh, the two experts we have shall critically engage with it and uh, um, get us further outputs, Prof. Markway. <laughs> and, and for me to keep my job, Prof. Prince Lou. <laughs> Thank you. Prof. Miwa, thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. I don't know how long you can sit, but uh, we understand you need to rush. Colleagues, the uh, bio of Prof. Janrik was published. You have it. I'm not going to repeat it. Peter, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Give him a hand. Thank you so much. I mean, really, this is it's such a pleasure and such an honor to be here with you. And it's been, this visit is something that has been in the making for a long time. We actually gave our, submitted our proposal for European funding even before the pandemic. So this is something that I've been looking forward to for years now, and I look forward even more to Paul's return visit to Croatia. But before I, before I even start, I would really like to say thanks to everybody. First, I mean, I think it's really important to acknowledge the great work of the International Office and Ms. Siza Magubane and the others who really helped this, this I mean, this may happen without the, these people. It just wouldn't happen. And I do need to apologize for my pronunciation of 
names. <laughs> English is not my first language, and many of the names are very hard, hard to pronounce for me. So I would also like, of course, to thank Paul Prinsloo, who for his continuing friendship and his continuing uh, support in our work together that we've done over the years. And then, of course, to Professor Tenyeme Meyiva, sorry for that. And, of course, to my respondents, Professor Mako and Malan, for, for uh, this beginning of our, of, of our conversation. And with this in mind, I would actually like to say, can you just give me the first slide, please? I would actually like to say that uh, 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 my, this talk is not really something that I see as me giving some sort of uh, 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 whatever, presenting really. I see this as a beginning of uh, an ongoing dialogue, a dialogue that has been going on between Paul, myself, and many others in the scholarly community. And I see this as the beginning of something. Can you give me the next slide, please? So I come from Croatia, which is a really, really small country. If you see this red dot at the map, it, you practically cannot see it. The whole country would fit probably in one suburb of Joburg or something like that. It's, it, it's less than four million of us altogether. I come from a very small institution. I've heard that you have 4,000 staff members. Well, we have 4,000 students at my institution and many, much, much, much smaller number of staff. I would say probably less than 200. And so this collaboration, as we can see from the map across continents and across, I mean, even across the equator, is hugely, hugely important for us in Croatia because it really opens up not just opportunities for collaboration, but it also all opens up uh, opportunities for developing new ways of thinking. It offers opportunities for, you know, for developing research, but also for developing these human relationships. If you can give me the next slide, please. So this is funded by the Erasmus Plus project. Uh, we submitted uh, uh, this proposal for this funding. We got this little money for my visit here and for Professor Prinsloo's visit to Croatia. We are applying for more money and we are hoping that this will uh, uh, extend in the future. And here I just put two photos. I put one photo of beautiful Pretoria and I, then I put the photo of my hometown just to show how actually different we are. But I believe that our power and our strength lies exactly in this difference. So if you could I will start this talk and when we speak about the digital and digitization and then suddenly somebody came up with the concept of the post-digital. And people often ask me, so what, what is it? I mean, why did you, how, how did it really start? Well, the idea is that, as you can see on the slide, Nicolas Negroponte back in 2018, sorry, 1998, excuse me, has actually written this article uh, called Beyond the Digital. And he said so that sometimes the defining the spirit of an age can be as simple as a word. And in the 60s, he said, actually, this character played by Dustin Hoff Hoffman claimed that the future was in plastics. Like, it was new, plastics was new, plastics was exciting. Of course, these days when you walk through Pretoria and if it's windy, it's all full of plastic bags and bottles and whatever and people selling them and other people collecting them and there's a whole ecosystem of pl plastics but we don't really see plastics anymore as something new, as something exciting. It's just become a part of our, it's become almost our second nature. So the question is about the digital. What happens to the digital? Whether the digital will become like this? And I would argue that it, it, it has already begun. One of the key, one of the key criteria for me is when you s notice something not in its presence, but in its absence. What does it mean? I'm completely used to my phone. I don't have it with me, you know, I'm a bit, you know, even though it's just there. But I would like to have it in my hand. It's kind of cute to have it in my hand. So when my phone doesn't work, the first thing I did in South Africa, well, probably even before visiting the washroom, 
was that I went to the I went to the telecom and I bought a South African card so that I could I, I could actually get online and be online. I didn't have anybody to really phone or text at the moment, but it didn't really matter. I just wanted to be online. So this is the thing about the digital. It used to be new. It used to be something that we would go all excited about. Oh, you see, you know, it's the digital. But now, actually, things are the other way around. Now we notice it only when it's not there anymore. I would perhaps, perhaps uh, make another, another example, which I know is quite unfortunate to mention here in South Africa, but load sharing and electricity, shedding, sorry, and electricity. So you don't really notice electricity. It's all around, right? But as soon as it goes away, then you notice that it's off, that it doesn't really work. So when it's here, we take it for granted. But when it's not here, then we say, aha, uh -huh, okay, so there's, there's a problem. It's not here anymore. So this is what happened to the digital, and this is what Nicolas Negroponte wrote about in 1998. If you could give me the next slide, please. Now, in year 2000, the musician Kim Cascon, he was a really interesting guy. I mean, he still is. I just was in touch with him actually a few days ago. He, he was an electron. Uh, he, he did music for things like for films like Twin Peaks and so on, and he did his own experimental electronic music. So he was a music, as a musician. He was interested in building his own stuff. So instead of working on an IBM or Apple or whatever computer, he would actually build his own computer. And he built it out of the conviction, ideological conviction, that if he creates music on an IBM's computer, then IBM is the author of the music and not himself. Now, as he built his computers, of course that these computers were crashing and dying and half of the time they wouldn't work. And that was the thing that, this was this glitch, this idea of glitch where the machine doesn't work or starts malfunctioning and within this malfunction, there is actually, as Cascone explained it, a breakthrough of the human into the technological, a breakthrough of the digital, of the analog into the digital. So there is an analog, a digital thing, but now it breaks, and because it breaks, it's an analog intrusion in the digital. Of course, there was a whole field of glitch art at the, at the time, he was one of the people who started it, but actually the idea was that he was the one who first used the word post-digital. To explain this entanglement, deep entanglement between the digital and the analog in our lives. And then I'll just show, uh, just give me the next slide, I'll just show a few slides. Since 2000, many people have actually did, have started using the word post-digital in many contexts. Just give me the next one. So this, these are some examples. They're not really important. There are many others. But actually, with those examples, I'm just, I just want to show you that there has been, so Cascone was the one who uh, mentioned, who first wrote the word post-digital in year 2000. And few years after, the word and the concept has been taken up usually in artistic circles. But then it was not just about yet artistic circles, it was also about uh, prints, uh, theory of uh, theory, art theory, and so on. And in 2014, we now had a, f a first special issue of a scholarly journal, so now in the humanities and social scientists, sciences, which actually talked about the post-digital condition and the post-digital research. So the term has been incepted within the context context of arts, and then it has slowly moved from the context of arts through humanities to the social sciences. And this process was remarkably quick, fast. It took 14 years, actually, for the concept to move through all these fields. And a few years later, in 2018, there's been uh, one of the post-digital centers launched, so there's the, the Center for Post-Digital Cultures at uh, the University of Coventry. There are others, there are places in Germany, in France, and so on, which use the name of post-digital. Now this has already begun 
become too big, so I cannot present everything. These are just some few examples. And then in 2018, with a group of friends, I kind of discovered the word post-digital. And we were thinking, okay, so what do we do? Because we were very frustrated with the situation within what you call e-learning or online learning or distance learning or whatever. You know, there's, I started my career as a physicist. My first degree is in physics. Then I moved to, on to education. Then I did a PhD in information sciences. I used to work as a learning technologist. Now I'm a full professor. I was course coordinators and whatever. So there, there are plenty of positions that I had within this system of knowledge production and dissemination. And in all those positions, you would always have things such as instrumental understanding of technologies. So we will use the computer in the same way that we use a shovel or in the same way that we use a spoon as a simple tool. Then there were things such as determinism, especially technological determinism, the idea that now technology has created uh, an ecosystem or whatever to which we simply need to adapt to. The idea of inevitability of technology, that technology defines the way how we should live other than vice versa. And there were so and there were quite a few things that I was frustrated with. And my friends and colleagues have also been frustrated with the same things. And we found uh, the concept of the post-digital productive in a way that we actually discovered that it kind of avoids our main frustrations and that it kind of really provides beautiful framework for the type of research and the type of practice that we wanted to do as well. Because I'm not just talking about research, I'm also very important talking about practice. But the thing is that the concept was quite underdeveloped. And now we thought, you know, I mean, there are many, many, many if you take a look at the history of science, actually things such as postmodernism, accelerationism, and so on, many of those movements and theories were really de developed in the context of arts and then have moved to the social sciences and to the humanities. So it was not kind of unprecedented. On the contrary, it was quite a common move, actually, to take this concept from the field of arts and to appropriate the concept for the purpose of studying, I mean, things, mostly education, but some other things as well. So what we did here is that in 2018, we founded this post-digital science and education journal, and then quite soon we founded the post-digital science and education book series, and now we are doing, we are working on, 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 on the, an encyclopedia of post-digital science and education, which will come out very soon, and so on. And we kind of created an ecosystem, a community, which has published, I would say, around 400 scholarly papers at the moment, 10-ish books. Uh, and we are really developing this post-digital theory and practice into ways that kind of avoid all those usual traps that I just mentioned, instrumentalism, uh, determinism, and so on, and at the same time seem to be productive for our understanding of the world and of, of course, the role of education within this world. And this is what we did. So it's, uh, this is how post-digital has really moved from the arts towards the humanities and social sciences. And I'm repeating this because the post-digital, hugely important, is a community effort. So it's not something that I can define for you. Uh, what I prepared here are some definitions that some people have given, just to try to give people a sense of what most authors of, of would seem to agree upon in, relate, in relation to the post-digital. But the post-digital doesn't really have its proper Definitions. I'll just read a few of them because I think it's interesting. Back in 2018, we wrote that the post-digital is hard to define, messy, unpredictable, digital and analog, technological and non-technological, and so on. So we wrote that the post-digital is both a rupture in our existing technologies and the continuation. 
And then Andrew Finberg, the famous philosopher of technology, who was, by the way, a PhD student of Marco, uh, Herbert Marcuse, wrote that these terms, digital and the post-digital, seem artificial. And he actually says that the post-digital could precede the digital rather than, than, than uh, the other way around. Paul Levison, who is the famous uh, a, a science fiction writer and a scholar, and by the way, the guy uh, who wrote with Marshall McLuhan, which is a big thing in its own right, he says that he doesn't disagree that we live in a post-digital age, he just disagrees that we are first entering it now. And then we have here Peter McLaren, of course, the famous critical, critical pedagogue who asks about values, who asks about our normative, normative uh, positioning towards the post-digital. And then we have those other scholars like Tim Fones, Christine Sinclair, and so on, Sarah Hayes, who actually talk about the importance of language, the importance of this, the importance of that. Uh, Michael Peters and Tina Besley, importantly for me, call for a critical philosophy of the post-digital that must be able to understand the processes such as quantum computing, complexity in science, and so on. And going a few years back, Florian Kramer, an art historian again, wrote that the prefix post should not be understood here in the same sense, sense as postmodernism and post histoire but rather in the sense of post-punk or post-humanism. So something that's punk and not punk at the same time. Something that's humanism and not humanism at the same time. You know, Croatia and South Africa have many things in common. One of the things that we have in common is that in Croatia we became a democratic country only in 1991. And I think, you know, and then suddenly there was somebody, not really somebody, but there was this political process. We went to sleep in one type of regime, which was the communist regime, and we woke up in another type of regime, which was the democratic regime. Now, have we all became 100% democratic from tomorrow morning? No, it's a process. So we are post-communist, but it doesn't mean that we are not communist anymore. It just means that we are becoming less and less communist in the process of transition, which takes a long time. And I believe that those democratic transitions and probably many other transitions which have followed, I mean, South Africa was really, really, somebody told me in, a, in my accommodation, he said, amazingly, we did all this and we didn't have a civil war. Well, in Croatia we did have a civil war, which not a civil war, but like a proper war, which was more than four years long and which was very not a nice experience. What I want to say is that we cannot just fall asleep digital and wake up post-digital. We cannot just fall asleep communist and wake up as democratic. There is a process there, there is a transition. So the post is not like something after, but it's a process that comes after. I think that this process things, thing is hugely important. And okay, so what I gave you by now is a kind of uh, 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 an overview of early developments of the concept of the post-digital. What I also gave you is just a few ideas of what the post-digital may mean or how it may uh, 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 develop in the future. And now, ex actually, this is the interesting question. I am, I would say, unfortunately, editor-in-chief of this post-digital science and education journal and the book series and now the forthcoming encyclopedia, meaning that a lot of stuff coming in post-digital, whatever post-digital writings, they go through my hands. I don't review all of them, but I need to read them in order to assign a reviewer. And because of that, I've got quite a wide overview of what the post-digital, of post-digital trends and of post these trends in post-digital research. So I've kind of distilled 10 main challenges of post-digital research or of post-digital practice, and I gave this presentation many times, 
but every time it's different because as the time changes and as new things come in, I will take out some, uh, one slide, I will bring in another slide, I will change the sequence, I will do something. So the last time I gave this presentation, it was about three or four months ago, and I changed four out of ten slides in the mid last night. In order, when Cesar asked me, can you please send me a PowerPoint, I said, okay, I'll send you my PowerPoint. So I just went to the cafe, I ordered a coffee, and I said, okay, aha, this is new, this goes out, this is new. So this is the state of the art at the moment. Ten minutes, ten presentations, ten, ten slides, Pecha Kucha style, just quick, and then I will briefly conclude. So the first one is critical philosophy of technology or science, studies of science and technology. The idea that we need philosophy of technology in order to talk about any type of online and distance learning. We need positioning towards determinisms, towards instrumentalisms, but also we need the positioning in terms of how all those things might interact with human nature and of course with the human society. So we need philosophical guidance. Practitioners in online learning will often forget about it, but actually it's hugely important. And when we speak about uh, 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 many, many, many articles that come in, actually find themselves in a deadlock because there's a tension that kind of seems unresolvable. And basically the answers to these ten tensions are one step back. Okay, the practice is fine, but let's go to philosophy. Let's mix the, the theory and practice in the form of critical practice that I'm going to talk about later. The second slide will be about big data algorithms, artificial intelligence, and of course all these things that Paul Prinsloo here, your amazing professor, probably, probably one of the most well-known uh, uh, researchers in this field, in, definitely in whole Africa and probably worldwide as well. Uh, what I want to point out to, to here is that we cannot talk about big data al algorithms or AIs or whatever without mentioning the context of capitalism. So this is my, this is my, you know, when we speak about things like Uber, when we speak about things like extractive economies, when we speak about, you know, we speak about things which are always imbued in communism. So we have here many different, Christian Fuchs calls it data capitalism, somebody calls it algorithmic capitalism, surveillance capitalism, techno-scientific capitalism, whatsoever. You will hear people say data is the new oil, right? Okay, cool. Well, is, if data is the new oil, then put some data into my electricity generator to create my, uh, to create my, you know? It is, but it's not in the same way, right? We cannot just speak about those things. This requires nuanced approaches. And again, people like Professor Prinsel and others are doing amazing work in this particular area. Now, viral modernity, I'm, I told you before the time uh, that, that my first degree was physics. And I'm kind of sorry because I kind of miss the century, you know? In early 20th century, you had Einstein, <coughs> relati uh, special relativity, general relativity, quantum physics, uh, elementary particles, doom, 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 doom. Uh, second, uh, uh, sorry, uh, development of nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, Cold War. You can practically say that the 20th century was the century of physics. But when I came to the party as a young stu student of physics, it was too late. Because you had cloning of Dolly the sheep, you had things like mapping human genome, you have all those other things. And Craig Venter writes, in 1999, by the way, was the first year in history in which research funding for biology has surpassed research funding for physics. So literally and metaphorically, both in terms of political economy and in terms of practice, we are, have moved from the 20th century as a century of physics to the 21st century as a century of biology. Amazingly, this guy that I, that's now here, oh, sorry, uh, the new slide, hey, thanks. Amazingly, this guy who is now here, Craig Winter, he wrote about this before the COVID-19 pandemic. And when I would talk about those things before the pandemic, people would say, you know, are we really in the century of biology? You know? 
But now, after the pandemic, I think it's abundantly clear that there's the biology and, of course, there's the physics. Online learning is a typical example of this uh, interrelationships between biology and physics. So we have biological requirements. We can go out of the house and then we have solutions from the world of physics, such as online, going online, computers, and so on. So bioinformation means the marriage of biology and physics. All these breakthroughs in biology would be impossible without computers, which are made from phys by physics and the other way around. So we have this huge merger. We have this... Re so I'm not again saying that the biology has uh, 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 replaced physics. I'm just saying that their entanglement is really important and has been now really put to the forefront, especially after the pandemic. Now, the next one is something that people often forget, and that we live still in the world which is very much divided according to old imperialist colonial, colonial lines and so on. I don't think I can actually come here and tell you something new about it. I think that you guys will be those who will know all about it and much more. What I want to say is that the old dodge, nobody on the internet knows that you're a dog, is false. They do know that you're a dog. They do know online whether you are from Germany or from Croatia. They do know whether you are from Africa or from Europe. They do know many, many things that even sometimes we don't want to know about ourselves. I don't need to give you examples of this because I'm sure that you are all aware of this, but it's very interesting that all those things always follow those traditional colonial lines. So when you order an Uber, yes, a part of money goes to your Uber driver, yes, a part of money goes to South African government in road taxes and petrol and so on, but the part as a rent goes directly to California. Now, that's colonialism in the worst possible sense because they collect the same rent from Croatia, from South Africa, and from everywhere else. So we are not talking about classical colonial lands, but we are talking about new colonial relationships which I think very, very important to talk about. Now, feminism, the fourth wave of feminism, I don't need, the Me Too is a typical example. I don't need to talk about it a lot. I, I would love to. I would love to, but we really don't have the time. The idea here is that post-digital feminism has expanded beyond questions about gender relationships and now includes very much questions about concern for the planet and all its beings, the Anthropocene. So the idea is that feminism has kind of expanded very much towards the environment in this fourth wave and it strategically finally uses technologies in things such as the Me Too movement. I think it's hugely important. The next one is intersectionality, uh, identity, abolition. We can speak about here about ethnicity, about race, about gender, about perceived gender, about what we would like to be, about this and that. And the thing is that it's not just one. As you will very well know, just in the few days in this country, I've figured out that I don't know anything. <laughs> and I've also figured out that it's not so easy as it seems, right? So those relationships between different identities and the way they build themselves, religious identities, language, linguistic identities, all various types of identities, actually create these intersections or this intersectionality of identities, which is hugely important. Now, post-digital theory offers us another lens here and offers us the idea that we also need to take into account online and offline st things. I'm not going to talk about this much more because I'm aware that you guys know about this more than I do. Critical post-humanism and transhumanism, the idea that human nature is transforming, that what technology is doing, it, it directly transforms human nature. In which ways? Post-humanists see it in one way, transhumanists see it in another way. I really don't have the time for this. I'm, I'm going to move on. 
disability studies have popped up as one of as one important thing. Because the idea is that disability is not just another identity, but it's actually the metrics through which things that identity based oppression occurs. Okay? So basically if somebody is disabled and cannot enter this building, you can posit that these people, this person is somehow disadvantaged because of their own failure, or you can post it that it's actually that this person is disadvantaged because of the building's failure, because of the fact that the politics and the buildings have not been uh, accommodating enough for this type of mobility uh, uh, that the person has. Now, technology offers us a lot in this direction, and of course, post-digital is hugely important. Please, let's move on. I really need to rush very quickly for, for the last few of us. Uh, but queerness is not in the body, but in the capacity of the body. We've had, now we have a lot of talk about queer theories within the post-digital perspective, because post-digital perspective has showed itself or is continuously showing itself as a productive way of understanding queer theories and practices. And now, what I just want to say here and or here really in disability or here or, or in whatever slides is that unfortunately the struggle is not finished. What we have now in Croatia and not only in Croatia but in whole Europe, we have a strong rise of right wing, -wing movements who would actually like to restrict people's reproductive rights, who would actually like to create restrictive policies towards various groups who would like to, record, uh, to, spoke, uh, to speak about disability as some, I mean, in ways that are simply not appropriate. And these things are not just a site of scholarly research. They're also political uh, arena, and they're also uh, an arena for fighting, for struggle. And this arena for struggle has been historically led by universities, and I hope that it's going to be that at least universities will pay, play an important, a good part in it. Next slide, please. Post digital. No, 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 no. Uh, one more. Oh. Up, back, 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 back. Okay. Post digital aesthetics. I talked a bit about post digital aesthetics. I'm not going to talk about it much. Uh, this is a typical example. There, there will be more. Now give me the next one. Now, science fiction and future studies, hugely important theme, uh, especially during the pandemic, people have worried, okay, so what's going to happen in the future? And those social science fiction methods that have been actually part and parcel of, of research in humanities and social sciences for quite a long time, have now risen into prominence. One of the things that I would like to hear and I've, 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 I would definitely like to talk about. We just did some quite a lot of work on social science fiction in 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 in, in post digital science and education journal, and I see a lot of reference to things such as Afrofuturism, but I don't know enough about it. And I really look forward. This is one of the things that I came here to learn about. So I would really like to learn more. I'll shut up now because there's no point in. Please give me the next one. The final one. And I believe that it's equally as important in Africa, in Europe, and everywhere in the world, is that people are not just beings of reason. People are equally beings of myth, religion, symbol, theater, feeling. So all, are, all of us here, we are not shaped just by mathematics and just by logics. We are also shaped by all those things. And now I, I understand that it can see, seem retrograde. But actually, there's completely no difference whether we are talking about Christianity, Islam, shamanism, or new wave things such as you know those all those uh, uh, fashionable things that now pop pop up. People have this need, and not just people that people just have this need, but also this need significantly shapes the way that we understand, that we see the end and understand the world. So even I'm, personally, I'm an atheist, even probably agnostic. 
I don't really believe in any type of supernatural things. But this opinion of mine was also formed through, I mean, my upbringing, which was religious, that I cannot escape from. So, and the idea, I think that I need to be honest enough and self-aware enough to say that my scholarly work is in part shaped by this. I mean, I, so we are all beings of that, believe it or not, and, and this is something that pops up quite strongly in, in post-digital research. So I will just finish only four minutes longer than expected, because I think that is just enough. I gave you an overview of what the post-digitalism could be. I gave you a bit of history. I gave you 10, ten main challenges of post-digital research as I see them today from my position of editor in various post-digital publishing outlets. Now, this is work is in progress. This work continuously changes. I think that after my two weeks in Pretoria, I will change this presentation into something else because I will learn something new. What I really want here to achieve here, and not just right now in this room, but in regards to all our collaborations planned for the future, is I want to learn from you. I would like to, if I have something to teach you, I will be more than happy to give it. And actually, we, a few years ago, we started this developing this concept of post-digital dialogue. The idea that there is a dialogue which need, I mean, dialogue is always the best way to, 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 to progress with things, but in a post-digital world, it's very different. Paul Prinsloo and I, the first project we did together was Paul's article published in a special issue that I edited in 2015. Probably, 2014 was the, was the time that we were in touch for the first time, so, so nine years ago. And it was called something Frankenstein and Beck, and you remember? Okay, nine years after we see each other first time in person. We meet, we have a drink, we have some food, and we collaborate. And we go, go out with new ideas, with new, with new proposals for collaboration, again, had a beautiful conversation today with Caesar. We will continue with all those things. We will make more, more and more collaboration between our institutions and between us as scholars happening. And I really want all of you to have an equal part in the discussion. And when I say an equal part of discussion, I don't mean just here. You've got my email. Email me anytime. Let's talk about it and let's 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 develop post-digital thinking and ideas together. So thank you very much. It's amazing when you meet a person online and you have no idea what he will be like when he presents. <laughs> and that was a joy to be old Peter. Thank you very much. We have two official respondents. I'm very aware of time. Uh, I'm not going to read both of your very long CVs. Uh, I will, would like to acknowledge uh, Professor Pimpini Makwe. Uh, she's the Executive Dean of the College of Education. And then there's this long bio. But her most cited article is the use of exploring the use of Mixit, which is sort of almost a predecessor of WhatsApp those years. A cell phone social network to facilitate learning in distance education. And her second most cited uh, article is conceptions of learning in adult students embarking on distance education. Prof. Catherine Milan, our second respondent, uh, she is in the Department of Decision Sciences at UNISA, and these people always scare me. They're very intelligent. <laughs> not Prof. Pini, not that your college is not intelligent, but, but those guys are amazing. Uh, she has a PhD in computer science, and she has a C1 rating in the South African context. Her most cited article is a survey of techniques for characterizing fitness landscapes and some possible ways forward. And the second one, I don't understand totally, Catherine,
But the second most article, quoted article is quantifying ruggedness of continuous landscapes using entropy. So, Prof. Pini, if you would like to respond to Peter and then Prof. Malan, and then we will have a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, colleagues, and thank you. Um, and I'm very loud, I'm so scared. <laughs> thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for the kind invitation. And thank you, Peter, for that stimulating discussion um, uh, about post-digital. When I came across that, uh, as, as I, and I said, I think I mentioned it to you, Mark Andrzejew and I were, were in the same university. We did a master's in journalism together. So we, we touched base and he sent me this article on post-digital whatever. And, and I thought, well, if it's post-digital, maybe it's linked to what I'm interested in, which is the futures of, of higher education. And let's look at maybe there is some, some semblance there. And... Um, I read through this article, but it was really fascinating. And one of the things that he said in that article, he said, the fascination, our fascination with the virtual character of software, applications, data, all these things that we're fascinated with, it shifts our focus away from the real thing under it, which is political, economic, social approaches to the media. And uh, we did a class together on, on media studies and, and we know what the media, the positioning of the media is and, and what the power that they have and, and the power that that entails. So, so all these things and, and now when, when you were talking and I'm like, okay, now it makes sense. It didn't make sense then, but now it makes sense. And, and I went back to the term post and I think that prefix, you explained it very well in one of the, of the, because when someone talks about post, it means that we are, we are now at a stage of transition. We are moving to a certain direction. And, and it signals that we have to reflect on where we are right now in order for us to make that big step. And um, the, the, the step of transition, the, transition, the shift, in the culture that we are comfortable with or the social status that we are com comfortable with. And it always goes back and reminds me of higher education, how stagnant we have been over the years and continue to do things differently. Even when we do things and in a changing environment, we still add those things that we used to do in the past. I'll give you an example of examinations. I hate exams with a passion. And this is one thing that I always say, and I'll say it again, that the minute I become the Minister of Education, I get rid of every exam in any place because I don't believe that we have moved towards examining. And why are we examining people? Is this the world about examining when people are not the same, when people are different, when people can contribute differently in different environments? When COVID hit, the first thing that we are concerned about was not whether the learning takes place. We were more concerned about if we are going to examine these people, they will start copying from each other. Then we brought a proctoring tools. And these tools are not even educational. They are not pedagogic. They, they, they are nothing. They are just tools, policing type of tools. The worst part of this tool, um, it has a, um, an emblem that has an, an owl. Now, in an African culture, an owl means something else. Here you are, a, a student, an African student, sitting on a desk, um, and then there is this thing that is looking at whether he's doing things right or not. And the first thing, he opens, and then comes an owl. An owl is a bad omen really bad omen. Now you think of your aunt who told you that you'll amount to nothing and now here's the owl coming. 
and we are thinking of all of these people who are the, the witchcraft thing because that's what we, we know the owl to, to represent. It's, it's not even, and when students complain about that, we say they need to get over it. Who came up with an owl? Who said maybe it came from somewhere else? Where an owl is considered something very, you know, we are looking at you. We are observing you, we are, we are doing these things. I always say, in the education space, we should stop being police because we are not police. We should start teaching. We should start enabling learning and so that we have students who are going to start questioning these issues that we are dealing with today. The, the digital space that we find ourselves in. A, a, a very complex space that is situated in, in, an, in a space, in an environment that we have very little understanding on. And I'm glad that you raised the issue of colonialism. I, I, I grappled with digitalization and colonialism because um, it's very difficult if someone brings a proctoring tool, they don't have any context that we're dealing with. They, they, it's, it's all about trying to see if you can get things right. And that's why I have a problem with exams. Whose right is it? What right are we talking about? So those kind of things are, are very important for us to start um, thinking about it. And, 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 and I think the, the, the digitalization, the success of it or the lack of, is that um, it provides some kind of solutions which can be implemented, measured, and evaluated. And this is a new neoliberalism agenda. And, and the higher education sector has moved to that new liberal agenda where we had forgotten our role. We are producing people who are not ethical. We are producing people who, who have no sense of humanness. And we even call those those subjects as soft skills, and those are critical skills. In a world that we live in, where people need to be human, where people need to engage with others in a space that, is, that, is, that cannot be measured or evaluated, but space that positioned a human being at the center. And, and, and now I think it's time to bring the human in the center. Um, and, and, and we need also, to recognize certain limitations of digitalization. Um, now with social media, we know that everything is on the social media. It has its good sides, it also has its bad side. When I cannot have a conversation around my dinner table with my children because they are all on the, on the, on, on, on the phone talking to other people while you are in the same space. And, and that, is, is taking away the, the environment that I'm familiar with, where we were talking together and discussing things. And, and also that is the art of humanity, where people socialize at, at that stage. But I don't want to talk long um, about digital technologies, but I think uh, it was food for thought that you brought to the fore, that we need to begin to think about what will happen, not, not, not necessarily at that time when it's happening, but post this time. We need to think critically about the current in relation to the past and in relation to the present. When plastic was the thing of the world, and now plastic is rubbish, and probably, may, and, and at the rate that is going, maybe by the time it's 2035, all these tools will be rubbish. There will be something new coming through. So thank you very much for just um, at, at trying to get us thinking about this. I hope I didn't take long. I speak, I talk a lot. <laughs> Prof. Malan, so Prof. Markwe, uh, so we await the announcement from the College of Education that you will now in future be known as the College of Post-Digital Education. <laughs> Right, can you hear me clearly? Thank you for inviting me, Paul and, and, and Peter. I, um, 
I'm one of those people that is involved in those algorithms and that AI. Um, so it's good for me to stop and think because I often, whenever people ask me, you know, what do you, what do you actually do and I admit what I do, then I have varied reactions, but most of them are along the lines of, you know, when AI is going to take over and that's the, all the, the doom and gloom and, and, and um, conspiracy and so on. Um, so it's good for me to stop and think. Uh, but I, anyway, so one of the thoughts I had just to start was with uh, um, post-digital, when you, when you spoke about it as um, being, um, it's almost as if it disappears when you're using it because it's become so integrated in your, in your life. And we had this similar concept when I was studying computer science. Um, so I was studying how to do programming and how hardware works and all this kind of thing. And then there was this course called Human Computer Interaction. And Human Computer Interaction was all about how you design systems so that the person who's using the system um, is achieving some task rather than using the, the technology. So in other words, you're not, you, you're writing a letter, you're not using a word processor. So it has similar, um, I was thinking that, you know, we, we were thinking of that back then and we've reached that point where the technology has become seamless in a way and fully integrated into our being. Then the other thing I was thinking about was this post-digital. So I like the idea of post being beyond. And when people think of digital, you know, what do you think of? Maybe on a, on a we can almost imagine a bit of a dooms, booms taxonomy of the digital world where on the very simplistic level you're talking about efficiency, that you use technology to be more efficient, to do things more quickly that are mundane and so on. You might use technology to uh, for connection, you know, to connect with people. I think that through social media we've become more connected with more people than we could possibly have been before, and so on. Um, there's also a way of, you know, we use technology for discovering information. You know, we, we take it for granted that it doesn't matter what question gets posed around the dinner table, there, somebody will always have the answer. Uh, <laughs> You know, what really is in bird's nest soup when we were at a conference uh, in China? And, and that sort of thing. Everybody, there's immediately an answer because everybody can find the answer. We all are connected to this wealth of information. So the, discovering information has become kind of seamless with, with our being. But the more recent and higher level thing that, that is happening at the moment, and I think it's going to be a bit of a revolution, is this creation. So, and I find it interesting that post, the, the concept of post-digital originated in the creative arts because what we're seeing now in terms of um, the society or just people, the whole humanity, is that everybody's being able to use AI to generate new things, to create new things, whether it's art or whether it's um, essays, or whether it's arguments, or whether it's examples. And I'll use an example. I don't know if you've heard of ChatGPT. So the other day, I was with my daughter. We were in bed in the evening, and she said she has to, she's 15 years old, she has to give a talk at school. I mean, a, what do they call it? Prepared speech on some topic. And the topic was something along the lines of great fiction being, um, uh, uh, bringing meaning and, and light into the dark world, something like that. And she said she really doesn't know where to start. And so we were talking and I said, you know, I wonder what something like ChatGPT would do with this um, question, you know, if you asked it. And she says, oh, I've tried that. <laughs> so. Here's my 15-year-old who I didn't know that she even knew that ChatGPT existed, has already got it on her phone, and is using it to, as just to see what it comes up with 
for her school homework. Um, and so we read, she read to me what ChatGPT had come up with, and it was actually amazing. It was really, really good. <laughs> so we, in this era of every, you know, the general public, every humanity using um, technology and using the digital world to create. And you can, you can ask ChatGPT, explain how this differs from that, or, and so on. And I think what's, what's frightening for me as a lecturer at a university is where does this leave us, especially now that we've done away with exams, <laughs> well, the, the contact exams, everything's online. How do, we, how do we assess somebody? What do we assess if you can ask an AI to generate reasoned answers for you? So I think that what's interesting about what this is going to do, I think, to us, if we're able to adapt, is that we'll have to change our whole way of teaching and our whole way of assessing. Instead, we'll have to ask students to do things like pick up flaws in arguments and so on, rather than make the arguments, because they can get something, an AI, to make the argument for them. Um, so that was one of the things that I was thinking as I was listening to you. Um, the other thing which I find interesting is that you said that post-digital is a community effort. Um, open AI was a community effort. So the whole open AI community, which is the, they were the developers of ChatGPT, um, that was a, it was, the idea was to, for people to come together who are involved in AI to make it accessible to people out there. And it's happened. It's, it's in our midst. And I think that we have some unique challenges ahead because of that. Um, that's what I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. I'm very aware of time, colleagues, but I also want to allow, allow people to engage with Peter um, and not miss the opportunity. Allow me just firstly to uh, acknowledge those that are not from UNISA. Barbara, Peter's partner, uh, we didn't welcome you in the beginning. It's great to have you here. Uh, Dr. Robert O'Coin from Queen's University in Canada and Derek Moore from Exwitz. Any other colleagues that are not from UNISA? Uh, that's great to have you in our midst. Peter, won't you join me? Oh, yes. I, oh, I, how could I forget that? But I forgot the name. I know it starts with the M. <laughs> I'm not going to make it because I'm not myself. Uh, Peter, won't you join me behind the mic? And then let's, let's get some questions. Uh, the post-digital is this big post-elephant in the room. So who would like to go first with a thought, a provocation? Uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So, <laughs> so we provided you with lunch. I expect a return on investment. <laughs> Derek, you came all the way from Johannesburg, uh, and it's not as far as Canada, but it's. Uh, what made you come? If I may ask so, you. So I do have a, I do have a question, but it really makes me seem like an idiot. But a post idiot. I'll, I'll be a post idiot. <laughs> Um, I, I saw you, you had um, a quote from um, Mackenzie in one of your, um, uh, Mackenzie Walk in one of your, your, your slides. And, and um, the concept that is talked about in one of the books is Victorialists and Hackers as the way of looking at the world. And the idea is we're no longer in a capitalist world. There are just two classes, victorialists and capitalists. And I'm trying to understand how post-digital and those ideas um, 
intersect with each other? So it's a really dumb question because probably they're not linked at all. Um, but it's, it's been an idea that ha has just kind of dominated my mind because I'm, I'm seeing more and more evidence that I'm just a hacker trying to uh, make ends meet and I'm not keeping up. But there are those people out there who are making money out of interest on all their investments and they are just shooting up hugely. And, and we've moved beyond kind of the divide between labor and, and, and those that kind of um, own the means of production. It seems something different. So, sorry, that's a totally different theory, but th that's where my headspace is at the moment. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's an amazing question. It's not that it's not only done. It's really, really very deep and creative. And, and it's also the question that I've been grappling with for a long time. The quote you saw is from a conversation. I did this book of conversations, interviews, where I talked to people such as Mackenzie, Vork, and then we would sometimes be in contact for years. So with Mackenzie Vork, I was, I've been working on this one article for two and a half years, pretty much, which included two visits to New York, my visits to New York and stuff like that. So, and I asked Mackenzie once, and she gave me this beautiful answer, which I think that is very, very applicable. I'll keep it in European context because I don't feel I could probably do it in a South African context, but I'm afraid to, to say something stupid. So Mackenzie said, you know, there was feudalism where you had those feudal lords, you had those poor peasants and so on. And then things have changed a bit. The merchant class has started to appear. Things have, uh, 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 so the, it was not just the classical uh, 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 people who inherited their rich riches by birth. Now there was this merchant class which kind of made their own fortune. So you had the emergence of the new class. With this emergence of the new class, you had very deep social changes, like intermarriages between classes, interrelationships between all those people in various ways. And it took pretty much 200 or 300 years in most parts of Europe to switch from something that could be called traditional feudalism to something that could be called proper capitalism. Now, if you lived in the middle of this process, or for those people who lived in the middle of those process, would those people recognize where they were? Would they know, okay, so this is not feudalism anymore, this is capitalism. They, they didn't even have the word capitalism back then. So once we go back to history, and we say, okay, so this is the continuum of what happened, and here we will paint, bring a line and say this is the wall. In year this and this, now we say, now we are not feudalist, now we are capitalist. But actually, the change was continuous. Change was permanent and the change took, with the change from feudalism to capitalism, in Mackenzie's words, was more than two centuries long. Now, what happens now? I deeply believe that we are probably, I mean, Mackenzie Work is not the only one who's asked this question. Slavoj Žižek has asked the question, what if this is not capitalism but something worse? Mark Andreevich has asked this question. Many, many people have, have asked this question. I mean, after so many of them, I, I asked in one of my papers, <laughs> following all of them. But the idea is that so we don't really, I don't think that we have the tools to assess the historical moment, our present. I think that we only have the tools to assess something with a bit of temporal distance, to see actually how things happened in the past and to be able to recognize those things. And of course, if you had a crystal ball and if you knew how things would develop in the future, you would probably be very well off, if not very rich, or 
well off in any sense that you want, in intellectual, not necessarily material. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't think that any of us knows what. We definitely have the disappearance of old classes, the latest one being the, the, the disappearance of middle class as the, you know, the world's richest, like your South African Elon Musk, who makes you know, his billions and billions and billions on what? <laughs> and then we have all those people, and then we have all those people living in great poverty. And one of the biggest achievements of the 20th century, at least in places like such as Europe and the US, was exactly this solid mid development of this solid middle class, which now disappears, right? So we have situations where we simply, we don't know where this is heading. I don't believe, perhaps we are already out of capitalism, yeah, but I don't think that we can claim this with any certainty without uh, historical distance. So I think that once the process, I mean the process is never over, but once the process is pretty much rounded, then somebody will be able to take a look at the whole process and say, okay, this would roughly be the dividing line between this and this. At this moment, we know very, very, very little. What happened in the pandemic, for instance, surprisingly, I'm not sure whether it happened around here, but I imagine that it couldn't be so different. You know, it was always like, you know, I am a, somebody is a, 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 a you had those teachers, so, so what, what do these people do? You know? And then suddenly, I have a nine-year-old son who was six at the time, the kids stay at home, and, and, you, and, you, and you need to homeschool them. And after three months of homeschooling your own kid for I don't know how many hours a day, you start to appreciate teachers, like, <laughs> like you know, these people who take this off your back and who do it somewhere else so that you don't have to, be, to do it. I'm, I'm, my first degree was physics. Explaining him multiplication was a nightmare. You know, because I'm not a teacher. And it's so hard to do. So what we all, all also learned, we learned the value of those, many of those occupations that we tra traditionally look down at, such as street cleaners, such as people who were suddenly crucial workers in, within the pandem uh, pandemic. Suddenly we had the situation that, I mean, you know, before the pandemic, oh, no, oh he's an important person, he's a manager. No, no, he's an important person, he cleans the streets. She's an important person, she teaches your kids. You know, so when something changes, our value systems change. But we cannot appreciate, I think that we even cannot, I, I did some research on the pandemic, sh shifts, but I even think that we cannot appreciate those shifts that it's still too early. That in five or ten years we'll be able to look back and say how many of this was temporary madness and how many of this has actually remained whether we now still value our street cleaners or we forgot all about it. Do we still value our teachers or we again forgot about it? That's gonna be, that's gonna be an interesting question in the future, but sorry, this is a very long reply and probably there's another question. Okay. Robert? Yeah, please. Thanks. So, I wear, well, we talked on Sunday, so you know I wear two hats. And one is kind of an academic hat and one's a consulting hat. The academic hat finds this really interesting. I mean, ultimately what we're talking about here is evolution. I mean, and maybe revolution, but definitely evolution. I mean, there was never a point in time when a homo erectus woman gave birth to a homo sapien child, right? There was, there was no cutoff. It was a very gradual thing. And I think that's probably what we're describing here. So we don't know when we're gonna make those transitions. And like you said a few minutes ago, maybe we've already made that transition, I don't know. So that's the academic in me, but the consultant in me wonders, and we talked about this on Sunday, I deal a lot with learning models, instructional design models, and I actually make money doing this. Of course. How is that gonna change? Or is it gonna change? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I really wanna put you on the spot. Well, <laughs> well thanks a lot for this question, and it's also the one that I've been uh, thinking about a lot, as actually, as we talked the other day, our our jobs do overlap in a sense that I also have this practical side of my, my, my work which is all about instructional design and all these kind of things. So I think that we are gonna see development of not just, okay, so a lot of digital technology 
was a matter of improving something that already existed. So for instance, we had a TV which offered us one-way one -way, uh, uh, communication, and then we now have the internet which offers us two-way or multiple-way communication. And this change is, of course, not just quantitative in terms of the number of communication channels, it's also very quantitative in terms of the ways that we can now engage together in collaborative stuff and so on that we wouldn't be able to do before. What I think is that our current technologies, these technologies excluding yours, such as AIs and so on, but those technologies such as learning management systems and so on, have kind of reached the point of maturity where, I mean, you can't really improve Moodle much more. I mean, it's been the same for 20 years now, and it's, it's not really going to transform into a you know, so on one morning. But fundamentally different technologies, such as AIs, or fundamentally different technologies, such as biotech and nanotech, I think are going to change things. Now, the question is how quickly, and whether if you are talking about instruction, then I'm not sure. Then I'm not sure. I think that it's going to probably take a while, and I don't even want to guess. But if it speak about things such as food production, then biotech is hugely important, guys. It's something from from simple things such as GMO. I mean, which is yeah, people complain about GMO, but it's fed millions of people who would otherwise have nothing to eat. <laughs> uh, we have total shifts. Uh, I mean, are we going to be able? to eat things from, from, from you know, uh, sea or something that we were not able to eat before. Or, for instance, when we have this, I was, I've been reading about South Africa's energy transition uh, this morning because I was, I was really fascinated by those, this, you know, there's just power blackout and okay, so why is it happening? And then I've read about they, that they kind of forgot to maintain power plants and build new ones for a while. <laughs> but it's a huge opportunity. Because, actually, instead of, okay, so there's coal, but instead of doing these things, South Africa now, in this big bout of development, in, in this big jump of development which happens, has the potential to move to, 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 to different types, cleaner, better technologies than it would be perhaps do it 20 years ago. I will give you one example, and it's at, at the expense of my own country, just so that you don't think that I'm just taking a laugh of South Africa. My country, Croatia, is a beautiful coast. And then there was a lot of, you know, 20th century, there was industrialization, people were building factories all over Europe, in Italy, in Spain, whatever. They would put concrete on, on the coast, they would, you know, build uh, things for tourists, whatever. And basically, most of these countries have destroyed their coasts along the way because if you have a coast with a huge power plant powered by coal, uh, you don't really, you know. But Croatia, because of very his hysterical, historical reasons, was underdeveloped, simply underdeveloped. It simply didn't develop technology industry in this period. About 20, 25 years ago, Europe discovers Croatia as one of the last untouched places in Europe where you can drive your car, it's very close, and actually, and actually we have beautiful coast, you know. It's, um, it's unbelievable how ecological are these people. I mean, come on. There's nothing to do about ecology. Simply, it was pure neglect. Neglect in one period was actually beneficial in, in, in the later one. So I don't think that every that every technological, and this is, now this is a serious answer to your question, I don't think that we should embrace every new technology. I don't think that we should rush, especially not in education, towards latest things. Of course, we need to learn how to negotiate things like chat, and so on. But I definitely think that sometimes a bit of techno-primitivism, not ludism, I'm not ex explicitly against technology, but a bit of caution could actually be more beneficial in the long run. So if, they, if there is a, the newest 
whatever biotech system for instructional and design, I would try it with pleasure. But I would be very, very careful about implementing it, especially at the scale of such as the University of South Africa. You know? I mean, because you can create, I mean, there's a lot of good things that can be done. And sometimes traditional, I mean, I'm all for new things, but sometimes traditional is not bad. There is a reason why things have been there for so many years. There, there is a reason why this, whatever, local healer in whatever, African or Croatian, because we also had local key healers who were, you know, not allowed to practice anymore because of the, and so it's all the same thing, a bit different. I mean, there is a reason why those people have existed for hundreds of years, because they did something, and they did something good. You know, so just replacing one with another, I think it's very short-sighted. I think we should create those, as my first respondent said, that I think that we should really create those dialogues between past, present, and future. I think that actually the one, the paper that, the first paper that we, we published with each other was the special issue was titled Intergenerational Dialogue. The idea that actually, not just gen generation in terms, I'm young, you're old, but generation in terms that we need to talk, the different generations of tech have their own value within the system. And I'll just say one, although I'm speaking far too much, my own son, who is nine years old, is, has motorically, not really, I mean, the log logopedists and so on say that he is not motorically like very developed. And I was like, I mean, how, what, the, I mean, he plays basketball. He, and then it turned out that 60% of kid are not, kids are not motorically developed enough because they don't play, play with toys, they don't play with stuff, they just click. So now, I mean, okay, yeah, I'm gonna give you a laptop, one laptop per child, excellent. Shouldn't we give them one hammer and 100 nails per child as well? <laughs> Together with the laptop. I'm not saying that we should not, that one should exclude the other. I'm not saying that we should give them just this. But I would suggest that we should be very careful with replacing one generation of technology with the new generation of technology without testing it in many different contexts in many different small scale ways before we move on. Uh, I'm very aware of time. I'm going to, Peter will be here, so I'm going to ask Prof Makanzi, she's my boss, uh, and I would love her to wrap up the meeting, but please, after she's wrapped up the meeting, please engage with Peter. Thank you, Prof Makwe, thank you, Prof Milan. That was amazing. Thanks, Derek, for coming all the way, and everyone else that traveled. Uh, and Prof Makanzi, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Prislo, and uh, good afternoon once more. Uh, it has been a very great and informative uh, workshop uh, regarding, you know, uh, post-digital science. Uh, I was very curious myself because looking at the title at the time, I thought, hmm, but we are not post. We are still within uh, the digital science and it seems to be evolving, but I've learned quite a lot today in terms of how our worldview informs how we see things, uh, science, digital education, and inform our involvement. Uh, I would like to thank in particular our, our guests uh, all over, I, I don't know, YouTube, those who are from other countries, but also uh, we have the support of local university. Uh, we really appreciate your presence and uh, how we build the ecosystem of um, you know, knowledge experts and cross-fertilize the knowledge in that sense. I also would like to thank uh, Prof. Makwa, Prof. Malan, a uh, very good way of uh, um, highlighting uh, knowledge mobilization uh, and how we interact with uh, uh, the world views uh, that others have, such as uh, uh, Derek and, and the entire scholarly field. Also to our international office, uh, Ms. Mogubane, we really appreciate you. Without you, we wouldn't be sitting together here. 
and of course our professor of note, uh, Prof. Prinslow, uh, you make us very proud and we are really grateful uh, that you have created a relationship, collaborations that has um, uh, put us all together in one room today to learn and to evolve in many ways. So colleagues, uh, with that, thank you very much uh, for, for this. Uh, we are looking forward to learning more and expanding relationships with you uh, moving forward. Uh, I, I deal with um, worldview, if I, if I just want to share this. Uh, I've developed with a team of scholars uh, a system that looks at depolarizing worldviews. So you find that in a class you learn a little bit about being an interprivist pragmatist and all that. And I ask myself, what about other worldviews? Do they exist? Are they there? And how do they shape our knowledge and, and our methods? And so we develop a system that uses natural language processing and machine learning. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> for me, it's, it's integrated to try and understand whether is there a worldview beyond what exists. Is Ubuntu a worldview? And if so, how does it shape our way of learning? Because as it is, we are still learning about John Locke's worldview. You know, we are still learning about all those. And but uh, Guangzhou in China and all others, where are they? Are they? Do they exist? And if so, what more? So I'm interested in um, poking a little bit more on your on your views and and the manner in which we approach things. So. Uh, without taking much time, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody.